Welcome to Paintbrush and Ivories, the podcast for artists and curious creatives that connects creativity with the heart and soul. I'm Michelle Walker and I'm here with my creative soul sister, Jennifer Ruth Russell. Hey, Jen. Mm. Hi, Michelle. I'm so glad to be here. Well, welcome everyone to this podcast. We've got a few things that we want to chat about. And one of the central points that we want to start with is this delicious quote that I found during the last week or two from George Innes, which says, the true use of art is first to cultivate the artist's own spiritual nature. So we've got a bit to say about that, haven't we, Jen? (laughs) Absolutely. It's such a great place to start. (laughs) It is. And in terms of the quote, what came up for you when you were, when you first read it? I think um, we're always trying to define art, what art is, because it's such a a beautiful esoteric thing. I mean, it's not something we can put in a box and say, this is what it is. And the true use of art, just starting that way, I thought was very bold for him to say that. And then First is to cultivate the artist's own spiritual nature. And I love that. Yes, that's for that and also for everyone that's receiving the art. I always think of art and music as circles that we as artists create and then people receive it and they complete the circle. So it's a beautiful, perfect giving and receiving. And I think that the receiving also is uh, of a spiritual nature. It takes us beyond where we are currently, which is something we really need right now in the world. What I love about it is it reclaims art off the gallery wall and back into something that's internal. So that whole idea of creativity coming from an an inner space, an inner spiritual state of being, I think is really important. And I loved that aspect. So we're not talking about art as a product out there in the world in a commercial sense, completing some kind of financial circle, but that it's something much more holy and much more sacred. Mm -hmm. And I love your idea of the circle of producing it as an artist and receiving it as a, an audience member. And, you know, you and I get to be both of those things, which is an incredible part of life for us. And I think that this idea of, um, I want to use another phrase, which I heard from Susan Melraith, who's a creative coach. I've met her through the Art to Life program. She calls it the coming from place or the come from place that is the birthplace of our artistry. And I really like that because it's not about technique. It's not about a headspace thing. It's not about my hand and the brush It's actually something very core to us as beings, as creative beings, and I believe we're all creative beings, so that it's drawn from that. And I think it's a really important topic to be talking about because art and creativity has such a role in the world right now. We are are being faced with so many crises. I'm sitting here 10 days having moved into a new house and a week after we've had major floods in my local hometown and in fact across most of eastern Australia from Gympie to southern New South Wales it's like a huge chunk of our east coast is being inundated and communities have been disrupted lives have been lost livelihoods have been completely decimated so what's the role of art for us now and How does it connect with our spiritual nature in the face of things that are unfolding around us? Mm -hmm. And I know that you're very connected too as well with the situation in the Ukraine and anyone watching the news would be seeing those images. What's your thoughts there, Jen, about how does our artistry help ourselves and others? Well, you know what, I, as you were talking, I first want to say too that the circle has to actually happen within us before it happens anywhere else, right? It has to be something that really feeds our soul. And I really believe that our artistry helps in these kind of times, not only the solace for our own soul of really giving us something to do with our hands, with what we have. You know, it it helps me a lot just to sit at the piano and play, just like it helps to sketch or to do anything just to do something. And 
I think amazing songs have come out of times just like this. Amazing songs that we kind of lean into during these kind of times, like, you know, pieces flowing like a river, flowing out from you and me, flowing out into the desert, setting all the captives free. Healing is flowing like a river, you know, flowing out from you and me. I mean, that that is a beautiful image of what I really think is real. You know, I think it's real. And somebody put it in a song so that we can keep repeating it and we can keep the momentum of it going and also feel like we're part of the solution, even if we're not there on the ground and we're not feeding somebody or helping somebody or keeping somebody safe. I think it is definitely our artists as nature. Our nature is sensitive. Yes. We've you know, we feel um, what's going on in the world before we even hear about it. And I really believe that this beautiful thing that we have is such a beautiful gift to us first and then to and then to others that we can share around us because there's always something to create from. I mean, how many times, Michelle, have you picked up your sketchbook um, when you don't know what else to do? That's exactly right. And I know that creating art, even if you're not a full-time artist, doing something creative can be really important for our mental health. I just saw an article this week that was talking about that. And obviously that's pretty good timing around at the moment where we're talking about almost not, not art therapy, but creative first aid. So you make something, you get out of your own way, you can lose yourself in the action of creating and give yourself a rest from the worry and the burden of what's going on. And it has been quite considerable. Like You're right that even though not being in a place doesn't protect you or doesn't shield you from being conscious of what's happening around the world, I felt very strongly the tumult, the devastation that's happening in the Ukraine. And part of my acknowledgement this last week where things have been challenging for me, and, and I'm not doing a comparison, but I'm conscious that others have lost a whole lot more than I have. Mm. But in my world, and people are reaching out saying, how are you going? And I'm saying, oh, I lost my enameling studio or some of it's, you know, it's all gone under. I don't know what the story is, but at least I'm not in a war zone. So, you know, that conscious reaction to what is happening for some people on the globe and how can we as artists, how can we as humans be in service of those people even though we can't muck in as it were. So one of the joys of being physically located where I am was I could go in and grab a shovel and get some boots on and get down and join the mud army and help my local community recover from massive floods in some mm. of the spots in town or turn up because they say they need pillowcases, pillows and toilet paper. I was like, well, I've got some of those. Let's just turn up with a whole bunch and help out at the evac center. So I think a lot of community members are doing that. But what do we do when we're not physically able to actually be right there on the spot? What do you do, Jen? How does your artistry come into that? I'm so glad you asked because my artistry goes to prayer, yeah. which I think is a creative thing. And I, I have a prayer I speak every day that really covers the world. I feel like it covers the world. Um, in fact, I just did it on my morning light meditation, just shared it with everything. It's called prayer for the world. And it's really commanding the highest and best for everything that's going on and really getting the company of heaven involved, which to me is one of the most powerful things we can do because there's a much higher perspective going on with what's happening. To me, what's happening in the Ukraine is a real call for freedom. You know, here we have one of our basketball stars from the WNBA there in Russia being held because she had, you know, she's almost seven feet tall, right? She's black, she's gay, she's really outspoken and they found a bait pipe on her. And so she was automatically put into, into jail and there's no diplomacy, right, for to get her out. But to me, she was like somebody that agreed to be that outrageous, to be seven feet tall as a woman, to be black and to be part of the LBGQ community and uh, to be an athlete. And I am seeing that she represents so much of that which is not needs to be freed in, in Russia, right? So much that is coming to like, 
oh my God, this is not working for us anymore. Okay. I'm just always amazed that this is, these feel so archaic and ancient. And most of the world, I believe is with me on this. I think that maybe 85, 90% of the world is in agreement that there is stuff happening here that we have outgrown. We don't, we're not in agreement with it anymore. And I am holding that high watch that we, that vision, we could call it a vision because to me, visions are like rooms in mansions, right? They are like a place for people to go to when they're ready. And I feel like some of us need to be in that imaging place of going beyond what we're seeing and really holding the high watch for peace. I was in the Ukraine in 2013 and I, I fell in love with the people there. Mm. You know, and when I think about them, I always tear up because they are so strong. They were women that traveled for four days on train just to come to this conference. And it was a spiritual conference because they didn't have the freedom to openly worship anywhere. Yeah. We couldn't call it a spiritual conference. We couldn't call it a church. We just had to call it a science gathering or something like that. But they were so hungry for spiritual community and nurturing that they probably would have walked if they had to, you know, it was just at their spirit was so resilient and I'm not worried about the people of Ukraine. I'm going to do my best to pray about them, but I know that there is going to be something that's happening here. That is so beyond what we're seeing right now. And I have to hold on to that. Yes. Yeah. The stories of resilience that are coming out of the Ukraine and their determination to hang on to who they are is inspiring mm-hmm. in the face of an incredible power supported by military power. It's quite yep, uplifting. And as much as I am devastated by the images that I'm sure we're all seeing, the stories that they're saying of being present to who they are as a nation and not being willing to let that change, not be willing in the face of what's world it's kind of global bullying and I feel that that is you know an incredible story I've heard I'm I'm sure other people have heard some of these stories as well but the one that I caught on the national news yesterday was about the report of a woman who walked up to a Russian tank as they rolled into town and her comment to the soldier was, you should have brought some sunflower seeds in your pocket because something's going to have to grow in the place when your dead body drops to the ground. And it was quite confronting that she, in the face of a tank and all the military might that Russia is pulling, mm-hmm. she's just declared it so. I think she, I think she was a grandmother as well. I heard that story yeah, as well. Yeah, she's and just... she actually gave him some sunflower seeds because <laughs> sun, sunflowers are the national product of Ukraine. In fact, they this war has been fought before because yep, when I the went history. there in 2013, they were still celebrating their independence. Some of the old believers were like, it was better when Russia, we were under Russia's rule because at least we knew the electricity was going to be on all the time. So they were really fighting as a country to really get strong on their own two feet. So this war to me is so, this invasion, whatever we want to call this, is much different because they have got on their own two feet. They're much stronger now. They're the agricultural center for Russia. You know, they are the place that grows the food. Just really amazing, strong people. Yeah. And they know whenever anything gets gets a little testy like this, they spread out into the villages. It's amazing because everyone had a grandmother or, or uh, an aunt or uncle that lives out in the boons and everybody like spreads out. It just like seems to be their main way of dealing with that to go back into the woods and uh, and live off the land for a while. Wow. So much is happening and so much has happened to you, beloved Michelle. So much has happened in your life. I mean, I feel like here I am in Los Angeles. We're dealing with a huge homeless population of, you know, homeless people that are unhoused, I guess we call them now. So there's lots of stuff that's going on everywhere. It makes me think about what our role is as artists in these Mm -hmm. incredibly challenging times. And I feel one of the elements you talked before about the writing of songs that really unite us and speak about the human experience that we're having that then turns into posterity that we can touch back to in future times. 
one of the things that I've seen is the role of the artist here. The photographer has been so important for recording what's been happening Mm -hmm. and helping the rest of the country understand what's happening, helping the rest of the country realise that some of their family or friends that are located in these various flood-affected places possibly need a phone call or people have been reaching out to me because they've seen the national news and oh my goodness, Michelle's just moved to that town. How is she doing sort of thing? So that's the story that's been going on. And I think that that's an incredibly important role for artists at this time is to record, record Mm. what we're seeing because we're, we're good at forgetting. We can be good at forgetting. And I think that the photography, the videography that I've seen has been so powerful to recognise both the scale and impact of the flooding that's happened, but also some of the imagery I find really hard to, to look at, the mm-hmm. scale of the rubbish. So so up until two weeks ago for the last 14 years, my hometown has been Lismore. We lived about 30 minutes north of Lismore at the farm, Surrender Hills. And I went for the first time on Sunday down to Lismore and I had to stop myself from repeating an expletive in my head as I was driving through because I could barely recognise. And in fact, it did look like a war zone. It was the, that mm. was the thought that came up. And driving down these vibrant town streets that I love and seeing three metres piled high of trashed furniture and belongings and precious things that had been affected. So you know, there's been an incredible, I guess, movement for people to capture some of these images and share them, social media, share them on the mainstream media so others can find out what's going on and hear about it. So it's not just through the national media that we need to get our messages. We get the personal stories and we connect with, you know, friends and family and what they're experiencing through what they're willing to share. I also noticed that I haven't been so badly affected, but some of my friends who've been absolutely devastated by the floods and lost everything, like lost their houses and lost their studio and their artwork. And in one case, Miss Jo has also lost her current exhibition because the Lismore Gallery went under. So she's lost three major parts of her life. Mm. Uh, I just, you know, I keep feeling into that they've gone very quiet and I understand why because there's not much to say there's such a deep well of despair in some cases that it's hard to communicate from and so we have to be really conscious as you know as artists we need to be careful with our fellow artists who have been under such incredible impact to make sure that we're continually reaching out and doing what we can whatever it is you know turning up to clean out studios sending money to GoFundMe programs just a quick message to say, how are you doing? You're right. You know, whatever it is, because that's, you know, such such a big thing for people. And I I don't believe in some cases people will recover fully. And one of the things that I've noticed in the, what's been happening is we've lost people's lives. People have lost their houses and their livelihoods, but we're also seeing an impact on community connection in both a very positive way, but also in an in a potential negative way that I know some people won't stay. So there's Mm. a sort of a a shattering of some of the community and the friendship circles because people, Mm. it's just been too much. So we've got to dig deep into our resilience to work through all of this. And, yes, you asked before, you know, have I been going to my drawing? I haven't actually gone to my drawing, but because I've had two things. I've, I've been trying to unpack the house and I've also been trying to clean up the stuff that I got from my studio that's been in the floodwaters. But today when I was washing all the metal and the tools, I was so itching to do some enameling. It was just, you know, it was like this overwhelming joy that if I could just connect with this metal again in the way that I love to. And I thought, oh, that's interesting that it's right there. It's, you know, despite how much work it's been to salvage it, I'm so grateful that the joy of working with this medium and the ability probably in the next couple of days or a week to get back into it in some form is right there for me. You know, I want to ask you a question, thinking about your friend that lost things on all three, you know, her home, her studio and a body of work. 
I'm thinking about her because I know she might not feel like doing that right anything right now, but we know that the artist within her is still there cultivating something now and maybe now's not the time, but I would and I don't know if you would ever ask her this question or if it's inappropriate at this time, but I'm going to ask everybody that's listening to this and you, Michelle, and me to challenge us to do a, a piece now, you know, something that would record it for us, for your own self, you know, and for me, I mean, I need to write a song about this time. And I'm just going to challenge everybody that's listening to what would be yours to create now? Yeah, great question. And in a bizarrely prophetic moment, the two days just before we moved house to Moolumba, we were staying near the beach. I finished four paintings, which I, I titled Flooded Country. Mm. And they are exactly what I need to speak about more. And in the middle of next year, my friend Jude White and I have an exhibition which was in its proposal form to the gallery going to be called Fire Scar. But one of the things I'm really feeling, and I've spoken to Jude about this, is that there's such a similarity for me on so mm -hmm. many fronts about the incredible devastation of the fires that we experienced in the Black Summer fires in 2019, 2020, to what we're experiencing now in terms of the scale of the destruction, the unprecedented, in inverted commas, nature of these events. It's a different natural disaster, but some of the elements of it are very similar. And it feels like fire scar needs to maybe evolve to also include the impact of the flooding to these same communities, to these same geographies. And it's always had an underlying commentary about what's happening with climate change and what's not happening with climate action at a political level. And for me, we're really looking to emerge some of the stories about what's happening for communities and do that recording and also some of the interpretation about that unprecedented nature and what does that look like and how do we embrace that as a community, acknowledging it first off and then realising the action needs to flow. Mm. So... Yes, I, I think the work is going to flow and I think it's not clear exactly what it's going to be like for others because I haven't had a chance really to talk in depth. It's been too soon, but definitely a floodwaters series. And I also harvested some of the mud from the Moolumba area because I want to record an earth pigment called flood mud brown mm. and that that will go into some paintings and some artwork as well so maybe the charcoal of the fires and the flood mud brown are, are kind of some of the elements that go into some artwork that mm. may be part of that exhibition in the middle of next year where we're talking about natural disasters and how communities recover yeah and I can see as you're talking this beautiful collection of artistry that is going to be flowing out of this as we always do we always do that we always record we always bring out more beauty something that goes beyond that helps people deal with what's going on that's what we do as artists yeah you know the the true use of art is first to cultivate the artist's own spiritual nature and I would say if he was going to add a second, it would be to cultivate everyone's own spiritual nature and lift us up into a new place. The true use of art. Totally agree. Mm. So it leaves me with one aspect that I thought might be useful to cover off with is talking about resilience. What do you feel or what do you think about, Jen, when you hear resilience and are faced with these kinds of massive world events. I think of spiritual strength when I hear that word and doing what we need to stay connected. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to stay connected to me is the most important thing. And that's a very resilient act because we could all fall apart, but it really wouldn't help anything. And we don't, as people, we don't, we're not built that way. We're really built to, you know, stand up again and keep going. Yeah. 
Resilience was one of the topics that I dug into when I was writing my book, 20,000 Brushstrokes, and I thought maybe I could just share some of the points that emerged from some of the writings that I had gathered. And I might be just to help people have these points just floating around in their consciousness. And if they realise there's something they haven't been utilising, it might help at this time. So I know that for you who are listening, you may or may not be in a place of flooded Australia or be somewhere else where this could help you out. There's 10 ideas that I just wanted to share. And this is really something to cultivate and attend to if we want to really help ourselves deepen in the resilience when we're facing setbacks. And the first one is a strong sense of self-worth. Also, an ability to manage your mind, including the ability to center yourself and become still and listen to your body wisdom. That's something I know you do, Jennifer, and I've had to acknowledge a couple of days ago, I just felt like I was, I was swimming through molasses and it mm. was my body just saying, exhaustion, stop, do not do anything mm -hmm. more for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You have full permission. Yeah, exactly. To full be permission. still. Be still. <laughs> Then the next one is an ability to stay focused on the positive and see the situation in context. Now, that's really hard at times. I'm conscious of that. One of the things that I was conscious of was while we were swimming around in this incredible devastation that was unfolding, we were still living in a country that was stable. We weren't at war. You know, we were, it felt to me that that was something I could hang on to. I think the next couple are really interesting and people certainly, I've witnessed people doing this really well. It's having a circle of friends and family that you can reach out to for support when it's needed and being willing to ask for help. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you need right now? And maybe it's just a quick phone call or maybe you need someone to turn up with a cooked dinner. Mm. But, but knowing how to ask for that. The next one is about being committed to working through, you know, like really facing what the issues are and working through the issues with some kind of flexibility. An ability to recognize your emotions and those of others. I think that is really important to acknowledge that globally, we're all feeling what's going on. And to recognize that has been really helpful to me. Like, why am I feeling more tired than usual? You yes. know, what's going on? I'm getting plenty of rest. It has nothing to do with my usual routine because all of us are being taken out of our routine as far as our the usual comfort zone. So I yeah. love this one to recognize our emotions and those of others. Just by saying it, there's a lot going on helps. <laughs> it does. And, and that we are being sensitive to it, even if we're not conscious of it. And so bringing that into our consciousness is so important. The last couple is an understanding and acceptance of what each of our strengths and weaknesses are. So for me, I've just known that if I try and push through because I want to get stuff done, I will pay the price at the other end. So I actually need to take it at a steady pace when the workload's heavy, because otherwise I can actually have a real dive in my mental health. So I don't know what's your strengths and weaknesses that you see coming to the fore, Jen. I don't know. <laughs> I would say your your ability to reach the world with your song and your prayer. So your divine voice that puts out love into the world is mm. part of your strength. Yes, I think that's part of my strength. And my, my weakness, I think, is that on some part of myself, I really wish it would all go away and I could just bask in the sun at the beach, you know? Mm. I, I, I don't want to call that a weakness, but there is part of me. And I think we're all kind of like this that, oh, let's just let this be over with already, mm. Mm. you know? Yeah. And one of your other strengths is, is your ability to feel into the sort of the field of energy and produce a morning light meditation for us to receive. That's mm. an incredible gift that you're giving. Last two is an openness to learning from our experience. And the last one's an ability to laugh at life in even the bleakest of times. <laughs> so some of that might feel yes. like a bit of a stretch right now. And I, I get that. 
I think we should all be doing some laughing yoga now because laughing yoga is when you kind of force yourself to laugh and then you realize that there's part of your body that really needs to do that because it's such a release of the tension. Yeah. We sat down and listened to one of our favorite comedians, a video that we had of his, Dylan Moran, who's from Black Books. He's Irish, love his work. He just made us laugh from the belly. <laughs> So that that was actually very cathartic. So I was very grateful for that bit of distraction. Well, folks, you may have noticed this podcast has come out a week late, but better late than never. And we'll be hopefully back on time for the third Friday of this month. Jen, thank you so much for joining me, for having this wonderful. conversation. Yeah, Wonderful, rich conversation. I love you, Michelle, and I love doing this with you. And thank you. Thank you for showing up during the floods, during moving to do a podcast with me. Thank you. Thank you. And your company is always such a joy. And we send our love out to all of those who are affected at the moment, right across Eastern Australia, to the Ukraine, to Russia, to all the communities that you know are feeling the ripple effects of what's going on. And there are many other communities that we haven't mentioned that we know are struggling. So sending love out into the world. May your week be a beautiful one. Yes. Bye for now. Bye.